I wanted to make a quick segue and talk about you and the projects that you are doing sure. because this is kind of this is pretty cool for the Wheel of Time community. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like and subscribe to the channel and for early access become a Road to Tarval and YouTube member. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about how Robert Jordan was largely inspired by J.R. Tolkien's work, and it's no secret. He often left little name drops and references. Take for example the Nine Rings Inn located outside of Kyrian, or one of the Ashaman who goes by the alias of Mr. Underhill. And I could make all kinds of comparisons between Ents and Ogier, Merdral and the Nazgul, but today we are talking about our anchor character, Moraine Damadred, a mysterious character who appears in book one with a more or less message of, I know what's going on here. There are forces far beyond what you can imagine and the journey will be hard. If you want to save the ones you love, come with me. And it's very reminiscent of one of the most beloved wizards in fantasy, Gandalf. And because I'm not a Lord of the Rings expert, I'm joined by a friend of the channel, Jordan Rennells, from a long-expected soundscape. It's so good to have you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. So talking about Moraine, talking about Gandalf, it's pretty fair to say that they both kind of serve as this shepherd of our fellowship. And of course, Tolkien did it first. Jordan kind of put his own little spin on things. Mm -hmm. But what would you say their similarities feel like off the top of your head? Yeah, definitely. I think that it's an unmistakable comparison between the two that kind of has to be made. But they're, they're pretty different in, in ways as well those differences evolve and, and expand as you get further into the Wheel of Time. They kind of stray further away from each other. But yeah, I think that, you know, right off the top, the kind of closeness or secretiveness of the two of them is pretty similar, right? They definitely both have more answers than they're uh, necessarily willing to give. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> from the beginning. <laughs> and, you know, they both are kind of on a level of understanding of the the ultimate quest that's trying to be accomplished here and what that's going to cost uh yeah. eventually and that they're you know of everyone in the in the fellowships you could say they're the ones that kind of understand what that really means the most and yeah. uh, maybe are willing to pay the price for it the most from the beginning there was something that i was thinking about in terms of kind of like their personality traits where when Moraine shows up, she's very kind of cloak and dagger. She's going by an alias and there's a bit of an iciness about her that I think Gandalf is maybe not as much. Sometimes throughout the series, you'll hear something from Moraine where she'll say something with that like really fierce determination where you're like, oh, Moraine. <laughs> And when at first when I was thinking about it, I was like, Gandalf, I don't really feel that as much. But then I was going through some of the quotes from both characters. There's one from Moraine that I think is just every Wheel of Time reader knows where she's saying, the dark one is after you three. If I let you go running off wherever you want to go, he will take you. Whatever the dark one wants, I oppose. So hear this and know it true. Before I let the Dark One have you, I will destroy you myself. <laughs> and I was like, oof, I can't think of like Gandalf saying something like that. But then I found a quote from him where I was like, okay, okay, maybe. Because he does have a little bit of this fierceness in him that comes out from time to time. Mm -hmm. This is the Gandalf quote that I really liked. I am dangerous, far more dangerous than anyone you are likely to meet, unless you are brought before the feet of the Dark Lord himself. <laughs> Where I'm like, okay, so like <laughs> there, there is a bit of this like, he might seem kind of genteel, you know, but mm -hmm. like really when you get into the thick of it, he's not someone that you want to like 
judge lightly, I guess. <laughs> I yeah. mean, he's he's a force to be reckoned with in this world. Definitely. Really. And, and and what conversation comes up a lot with Gandalf is, you know, what would happen if Gandalf got the ring? What would have right. happened if if he would have, you know, taken it from Frodo or or whatnot? And a lot of it, the conversation kind of boils down to that it would be a way worse scenario. It would start off, you know, from a place of wanting to do good, but eventually through that, it would become far worse than if Sauron got the ring. So that conversation happens a lot. And, you know, I think when you're introduced to Tolkien's world, it's very warm and it's very... Yeah we're in the Shire and things are nice. Things are really nice for a little while. And I mean, it takes Frodo 17 years to actually get, get going on the quest. Um, but it's interesting because as the reader, you, you have a comfort in Gandalf right away, but yeah. you also get hints of, you know, the other hobbits are like, I don't know about this wizard. You know, he's just, stirring up trouble around here. And yeah. as you go further into the story, you start to realize that Gandalf is far, far more than, you know, just the wizard along the along the journey with you. Right. So he's a Meyer. So he's tech like he was there when the world was created, kind of thing. So he I mean, that's something that we can get into a little bit later with the differences between the two characters. But um, yeah. Gandalf is significantly more powerful than he appears. Yeah, at surface level, it is kind of just like, oh, like he's this nice guy. He shows up warning about <laughs> danger. And I mean, for me, I read the series when I was really young. So like, mm -hmm. that's what I kind of latched onto. But after looking at things, it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> like, <laughs> he's not, there's, there's definitely like a deepness behind him mm -hmm. that I think, I wouldn't write off, especially in comparison to Moraine, because I think she shows that, I don't want to say darker side, but more mysterious side. I think it's a little bit more front and center with her than it is with Gandalf. But there's both that quality in the two characters, I would say. Mm -hmm. And there is the moment that is the kind of most direct comparison. In Return of the King, there's a chapter called The Last Debate. And basically Gandalf and Aragorn, they decide that the thing that they have to do is go to the Black Gate to distract Sauron in the super vague hope that that might buy Frodo some time to destroy the ring. And it's the same thing you can see with Moraine, where the, the, the quest itself is, is the most important thing. So we're going to throw everything that we can even just as a distraction in the in the hopes that it'll work, you know, in the hopes that Frodo will accomplish his goal or that Rand will accomplish his goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very interesting to see that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. The greater purpose between them. Yeah, I'm excited to talk a little bit more about that maybe when we get to some of their methods and mm -hmm. sacrifice. But would you say in terms of magic like when you think about the magic system in lord of the rings versus the wheel of time do you feel like there's a little bit of an overlap there hmm. discussing the magic in the lord of the rings is always tricky especially compared to wheel of time there's no there's really no comparison between how we under how clearly we understand it for wheel of time versus how we understand it for lord of the rings gandalf i think like moraine uses his magic very sparingly. And it's interesting because in the same way in The Wheel of Time, when Gandalf uses his magic, it's very much like a beacon to anyone that's nearby that is like, Gandalf is here. And, you know, anyone can see the signs that that's happening. And for Wheel of right. Time, it's, it's different because it's like, okay, there's an Aes Sedai around. It's not necessarily right. Moraine specifically, but it's that right. same kind of idea for sure. I do like how Moraine, she's not always going to be the one with the most epic display of power in terms of like all of the characters that you have in the Wheel of Time. She's not, you know, ranked the most powerful in terms of magic goes. 
But I think what's really interesting about her character is, like you said with Gandalf, like, do we need a distraction? What does the situation call for? And she's going to look at it very tactically, I feel like, Mm -hmm. where she has many tricks up her sleeve, but it's not always going to be the most epic display of the one power, even though she is, you know, pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that happens a lot with Gandalf where it's it's just not really how the magic works in Lord of the Rings either. It's not like showy magic, I guess you could say. It's more subtle things that aren't explained and uh, don't really need an explanation. But when when Gandalf uses his staff to flash, you know, huge huge uh, light for the fellowship. Yeah. That's a good example of him using some of his uh, some of his magic and again it's not as like some aggressive flames coming out kind of magic or anything like that it's for a specific tactic i wanted to ask you about with the magic and the lord of the rings with the wheel of time channelers don't have like an infinite amount right like they can wear themselves out with the use of the one power is that anything that gandalf ever has to deal with in the books. Yeah, definitely. And and again, it's not addressed as directly as Wheel of Time is, but a good example is when they're in Moria, the first time the Balrog shows up. And mm. we have to keep in mind, in the books, the Balrog is not necessarily a, a four-story tall being. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but so when the Balrog first shows up, Gandalf uses a, a spell to kind of seal a door and the Balrog uh, breaks through it anyways. And Gandalf even says that that almost broke him already. And when the fellowship, you know, they run off and then they finally see that it's a Balrog. Gandalf, I, I don't know the exact quote, but Gandalf says, I'm already weary. I'm already, look at this ill fate. I have to fight this thing and I'm already, you know, I've already done myself in so far. So yeah, that's definitely a thing, and uh, it's not an unlimited source of (laughs) energy that he has. Right, Yeah. right. So with these two characters, there tends to be, I think, maybe a little bit of a different strategy when it comes to fighting against the side of evil, and Moraine is a bit I think personally, maybe a bit more cloak and dagger, a little bit more into like political machinations, <laughs> if yeah. you will. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting you say that because you can read into, and this is more in the movies, like they kind of play it up a little bit in the movies, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the books as well, where, you know, Gandalf is moving the pieces into place where he wants them to be because he knows that that's what it has to be um, to make this happen. And, you know, a good example is like, why does he disagree with Frodo when Frodo says that Gollum should have just been killed? Right. And a lot of Gandalf's whole thing is pity. Right. And, you know, maybe Gollum will play a part later. Right. So he kind of gives Frodo that idea early on. And, you know, in the end, it's vital to the, to the destruction of the ring. But there's scenes in, in Gondor where Gandalf is, you know, trying to get Denethor to do a certain thing, to think a certain way. Um, it's definitely not as, you can, you can tell me if you agree with this. I feel like Moraine is very like, I'm going to do, no, do what I need to, no matter what. And if you don't like it then that's too bad for you kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, she she even has a quote, I think, that's take what you want and pay for it. Like, that's awesome. <laughs> do what you got to do, but if there's a price to pay for it later, like, just keep on trucking. Like, yeah. she's just so singular focused. <laughs> yeah, I think that that, is, that might be a, an interesting difference between the two of them where, and a difference between the stories because... Like, would you argue that Moraine knows, or at least knows how things should unfold at the end? At the end? Okay. So this is obviously, it's a, it's a bit of a spoiler, but I think, um, I'll I'll kind of be vague about it. 
So she does come into contact with certain characters and entities that give her an idea of how things are going to play out for her. So she does have a bit of an idea in terms of like what's going to happen later on. And in this world, you do have characters that have, you know, foretelling and insight to what can happen in the future. But in terms of like the end game, like exactly how things need to play out so that Rand can prevail, she doesn't really have that like perfect checklist. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? But she definitely isn't afraid to kind of scheme or browbeat someone into the direction that she thinks is best. And I would say with Moraine, sometimes she thinks she knows what's best and it comes back and bites her in the end mm -hmm. where she just totally made a misstep. But that's more kind of in her approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. It's because... I, I guess if you compare the two, and again, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Moraine at least knows that like it's going to be Rand, and Rand, is, Rand has to be there no matter what. Yeah, and, yeah, that's, that's I, would, I would agree, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or at least she's staking everything on that, right? Yeah. And in The Lord of the Rings, you know, they have the Council of Elrond, to kind of decide what we're going to do. There's nothing showing that this is like the faded way that things are going to, that things would have unfolded anyways. And a lot of the time through Lord of the Rings, it's like, how can we be secretive? How can we get there quietly? How can, you know, when they leave the Council of Elrond, they don't take all the strongest elves with them and, uh, you know, <laughs> kind of blaze their way towards the finish line. Yeah. You know, they sneak their way there and, um, there's even some choices that the fellowship makes that Gandalf probably wouldn't have made if he had been there. And it's again, it's all in the hopes this, that this will, will work versus I think in Wheel of Time, it's more like we have to get everything into place so that it will work. Right. If that makes sense, that that kind of distinction between. Yeah. The two. Yeah. I mean, with with the Wheel of Time, too, there's so much that has to deal with prophecy where it's kind of like everyone's fate is pretty much sealed, you know, mm. like it, things will just happen how they're supposed to because the pattern wills it. <laughs> like the pattern will literally push people in a direction like you need to be here, buddy, sit down, <laughs> you know? It's so interesting comparing that because there's such a, you know, discussion in Lord of the Rings between fate and free will because everything comes from Eru Iluvatar, the god of Lord of the Rings, there's a line that oh, comes from wow. the Silmarillion. Okay. Yeah, there's a line from the Silmarillion that uh, Eru says, you know, everything that you do shall prove but mine instrument is the the line that he says. So basically, he's saying this to the, to the kind of Sauron 2.0, the kind of Melkor, the more evil version of Sauron, I guess you could say, or the previous mm -hmm. version. And Basically, he's saying that no matter what you do, even if it's evil, it'll have come from my plan anyways. So it's going to pay out the way that I wanted it to anyways, no matter what you do. And so because Melkor is trying to interrupt the music, they call it, right? He's trying to screw with the world creation and make things himself. But you can't make things yourself. Only Eru can do that. and so. No matter how evil or whatever, Eru can kind of correct it back into his original plan, which is really interesting comparing to Wheel of Time because it is, you know, pretty similar. Yeah. But there's a discussion about fate and free will, and I, a lot of people boil it down to there's things that are fated to happen, but they have free will in whether or not to take that road or not, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Whereas I guess the pattern would would not allow that to happen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I mean, it, I think there is too, like the argument to be made that the pattern is always like recorrecting things. So even if someone like sat down through a tantrum and was like, I am not going on this <laughs> journey, well then, okay, that's fine because everything's just going to spin back up in a couple, you know, 
hundred thousand years <laughs> yeah. and we're right back to this yeah. <laughs> quest again. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's very interesting to <clears throat> to watch that almost the same kind of idea unfold in, in totally different ways between the two stories. And I think yeah. that, uh, you know, Moraine and Gandalf are aware of this at such a higher level than our point of view kind of characters, you know? Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The introduction of these two, I never really, and I think it's because of the tropes, like the fantasy tropes, because, you know, having any type of familiarity with Gandalf, when Moraine shows up, it's kind of like, She's here. She knows everything, but can you really trust her? <laughs> and I think for me, I was like, of course you can. She's not the bad guy. There's no way. I know how <laughs> this goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. You, you, as soon as you, I, I can't even say as soon as you read Tolkien because everyone is so, and not everyone, but most people are aware of who Gandalf is and his like archetype, yeah. you know? And so mm -hmm. I feel like, yeah, it's hard to not, see Moraine and be like, oh, okay, that's, so you're that character, <laughs> you know, and right. it, it evolves from that for sure, but it's definitely that same kind of scenario where it's, okay, you're the guide character. Um, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit, and this will probably get into more about Gandalf and Frodo and, and maybe some of the other characters that he interacts with. But I wanted to talk about their approach and methods because with Moraine, her relationship with Rand, who is essentially like he's he's like the sheep that she is shepherding. <laughs> yeah. And their relationship is very tumultuous because there is this layer of mistrust. And some of that, of course, is from the shadow kind of telling Rand, you know, you can't trust an Aes Sedai. And he's from a place that generally doesn't really trust Aes Sedai anyways, <laughs> but he's concerned with being a puppet for the White Tower. And she kind of goes into things in a way where she's holding back the truth from him. And in this instance, it kind of puts them on edge with one another. Is there maybe a difference that you see between that and with Gandalf? Yeah, I think that in the Lord of the Rings, Frodo especially, but most of the characters trust Gandalf and whatever he says, that's what we're going to do. Um, and so it's a huge blow when they lose Gandalf. You know, what are we supposed to do now? Do we even continue is a, is a big conversation that happens. <clears throat> and Aragorn has to become the guide. And there's, you know, quite a few chapters of Aragorn being like, I, I don't know if I I can lead this, you know, like, are we supposed to go after Frodo and Sam? Do we save Merry and Pippin from the orcs? Like, like, what do we do? There's no Gandalf now, so we don't know. Right. And there's a very clear regaining of that guide when Gandalf comes back. And it's like, when Gandalf comes back, he's not just a more powerful Gandalf, he's a more knowledgeable Gandalf in terms of the big picture when he when he dies he's sent back right he's sent back by the powers that be um and they say you know you're not finished yet you got to see this thing through mm -hmm. and so when <laughs> so when gandalf <laughs> comes back the the fellowship that he meets with you know aragorn legolas and gimli are like okay you know we're we're back in safe hands a little bit here and and they they still have to figure out you know how they're going to do things but you can definitely feel that comfort come back and i think it's you know certain characters along the way like boromir at certain points you know we just climbed all the way up this mountain and now we got to go back and are we sure that we even should be following what gandalf says you know um right and at that point gandalf is like you know, I'm just trying to find the best way to do this myself. Like, I don't know the the best method. And the thing that people sometimes forget, which is, I think, pretty different from Wheel of Time, is that the question might come up with, why doesn't Sauron just send all of the ring wraiths to scour the hole, like to scour the Shire and find the ring? Like, just do a full sweep, right? Mm -hmm. 
Like Sauron doesn't even know where the Shire is. He's heard that word before, but he doesn't know where it is. He has to go find it, right? And so Gandalf might have knowledge of Middle Earth, but to actually know exactly the path to take is not really, you know, there's maps and stuff, but it's not like, <laughs> let's take this road from here to here and here to here and, and we'll be perfect the whole way, you know? Um, whereas in Wheel of Time, I think that the geography is a lot clearer, maybe, and that can help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a good point. I mean, with Moraine, I don't know if you ever read the prequel book, the uh, New Spring book. I'm, I'm still working my way through it. <laughs> okay, okay. But I, what I think is really interesting about her part of the story, I love New Spring, and it's because she first off kind of wanders into this situation where she gets the knowledge that nobody else has. She knows the time of the birth of the Dragon Reborn, so she's got a bit of a head start. So you think about her kind of like popping around from village to village, like looking at her checklist, like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm looking for someone this age. And then she's trying to kind of get an idea of have anybody heard of kind of odd things happening? Because with, you know, male channelers, it's typically mm. just things that seem miraculous or like someone almost died in like an accident, but didn't. And she's really kind of just taken the roads back and forth, stopping at different cities where her story feels really fleshed out before you start the actual like mm. main series. But for me, like, I don't, I don't know a lot about Gandalf, like pre the Hobbit, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know a lot about his origins. What's he doing when everyone else is kind of just out there living life? <laughs> yeah. 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 And I mean, the, the, the wizards or the Istari are sent to Middle Earth, they have like, like I talked about with Gandalf 2.0, they have like a goal, you know, to protect the world and to, you know, protect men. So we don't get too much in detail about Gandalf from beforehand. But it, like I said earlier, if you trace it all the way back, you know, he was there during the music, as I was mentioning before, during the creation yeah. of the world. So he was there at the beginning. And so his, kind of knowledge and power is something that you can't really even fathom uh, in, in the Lord of the Rings world. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that he necessarily knows what to do specifically. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like Eru has told him specifically what to do and he just has to kind of do his best. And there's, there's definitely scenarios where it, falls back on him. You could wonder how things could have gone if, you know, if Faramir had been part of the fellowship instead of Boromir, you know, how would have that played out or how would have all these little things played out? But that's the interesting thing about the way that it ends is that Eru kind of manages to make it work in the end. There's the big discussion of Frodo because Frodo fails in the end. And there's letters from Tolkien that say specifically that Frodo fails in the end. But he fails. There's like big, a big but to that, which is that he got as close as anyone could have to reaching the goal. And then Eru gives that little tiny push at the end that sends Gollum into the, into the lava with the ring, right? So a lot of people will be like, well, should Gandalf have had the ring? Should Elrond have had the ring? Should... Frodo have given it to Galadriel, like all these people that are way more powerful than Frodo. But in the end, Frodo is the one that could have gotten as far as he did. You know, that's, I mean, that's kind of similar to Rand, though. I mean, when you think about the route that he takes at one point, I mean, it gets pretty close. It gets pretty close to the point where, you know, he. He could have, he was right on the border there. He could have mm -hmm. taken a left or right turn. And of course, you know, talking about tropes, I think everybody knows he's going to take the right turn and <laughs> yeah. do what he needs to do. But he almost failed as well. Like, mm -hmm. but if it weren't for, I guess this leads up to our next <laughs> topic, but some of the acts of sacrifice along the way that he witnesses, I think 
it, it could have gone the other way. So I wanted to bring up this shared theme of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Ah, sacrifice. So like I said, uh, in Moria, that's the big sacrifice, obviously, with Gandalf. Um, and there's a point where, you know, Gandalf says, I'm going to fight this Balrog and you guys have to go. And then we lose Gandalf. And it's interesting, and I wanted to talk to you about this in, in talking about tropes and things like that. You know, mm -hmm. is it, in, in Tolkien's world, a lot of things are, he's not too worried about spoilers, like in-world spoilers. He'll, in-story yeah. spoilers, I guess you could say. The characters, and I guess us first time reading, would have no reason to think that Gandalf would come back. Nothing in the story that would point to that, especially because Gandalf doesn't know it himself. He's sent back, and it's interesting because as soon as you read Lord of the Rings, or if you're aware of Lord of the Rings, and you're introduced to a character like Moraine, I feel like you could be like, oh, she's probably going to, we're probably going to lose her, and she's probably yeah. going to come back. You know, I wonder how that, that affects the mentality of that character. Like, if you hadn't read Lord of the Rings, with Lord of the Rings, I think like that's one of the series that like gave birth to this trope in such a way that where you have something going totally in the opposite direction, like A Song of Ice and Fire, where mm -hmm. like Tolkien was like, okay, we've got this guy. He's, you know, kind of your, your anchor. You're going through, we're going to lose him. He's going to come back. And you go to something like A Song of Ice and Fire and you know, you've got people like Ned Stark where you're like, hey, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And then it doesn't, it doesn't yeah. happen. And you're just like, okay, wow. But Wheel of Time, I, I would say it's a little bit slightly in the middle between these two series, but it, in this, in this topic that we're talking about, it's so similar to Gandalf where I don't want to say exactly what happens if someone is watching this. I don't want to, you know, spoil anything. But vaguely, you could see where a character like Moraine would definitely take a similar path like that and not be worried about it. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. And going back to the sacrifice thing, I think that the most important part is that they both know that saving the world, essentially, from darkness is far more important than anything that they have. You know, like if the if if Gandalf has to fall to make this happen, then he's gonna he's gonna do that. You know, yeah, because the the stakes are that high, I guess. And mm -hmm. I think that you also need it, like the you need it for the other characters. You know, yeah, um, because if Gandalf is there the whole time, he's they kind can't of really come into their own. Yeah, you and know? there's nothing really to worry about. You might say. You know, mm -hmm. um, because there's a good portion. Like if if Gandalf had been there, the fellowship probably wouldn't have broken up, and you know they what they make their merry way to the, <laughs> you know, to Mount Doom, and it's all good. You don't get too you know, easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't get two books worth of of Frodo and Sam trying to figure out what to do and and you know struggling through with Gollum. Um, and of course that. I mean, that's a simplistic way of being like, yeah, if the story was different, it would be different. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, it's still it's a good point to make. I mean, I'm thinking about all the instances in the Wheel of Time where I mean, there are some books where Moraine's off to the side doing something else and she's not with Rand. It definitely makes things, it ups the ante, I guess, where he definitely has to think for himself and really not rely on anyone else. But Moraine is such a, I feel like such a human character and compared to the almost like otherworldliness of Gandalf, where like I think so too. When, I think when that Gandalf comes back, it's like there's almost something godlike about him, and it, it's really like like awestruck, you know. Yeah. Like he shows yeah. up, and it's just like you know, like you can just picture like the lighting, the light changes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah, <laughs> the <exactly>. angels sing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, you could even go so far, probably, as to to call what Gandalf is 
like a lowercase g god, you know? Yeah, yeah. And if Eru is the capital G, then Gandalf and those like him could be a little further down on that list. Um, mm -hmm. Not directly, but a little further down. And it provides an interesting comparison because, again, when when I was reading Wheel of Time, having such a kind of thorough knowledge of of Lord of the Rings or, you know, having been with Lord of the Rings for so long that I don't, I don't remember reading it for the first time. Like uh, I don't yeah. remember watching the movies for the first time. I just am aware of the story, you know, and mm -hmm. with wheel of time, it was very interesting reading it and being, you know, how is Moraine going to handle things? How is, how are the other characters going to react to Moraine? Because I'm so aware that this is a Gandalf type character. You know? Yeah. So I'm looking for ways that it's different. But like you said, Moraine is more is closer to to Rand and the others in terms of her being. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's interesting when Rand, like you were talking about, when Rand doesn't have her around, he almost reluctantly it seems starts to be like, ah, if, you know, if Moraine was here, you know, what would I do? What would she say? And trying to almost grudgingly take uh, guidance from it still. You yeah. Know, it's, it's the type of character you're like, you know, I, I didn't appreciate as much when she was right beside me, but now that we're in different parts of the world, I, I wish, <laughs> I wish she was yeah. here still. Yeah. I, I do appreciate this relationship between the two of them. And I think it's in a very political way because she is royalty. She's lived a life of luxury and she also like went to the tower and even just not even just in her point of the story within, you know, having to do with Rand, she's made really big sacrifices just to become an Aes Sedai. And she might not even really care about that. Like, the I said I wanted to put her on the throne in Chiron, and she said no. So she ran away from the White Tower. Like she was just like, see ya. Like I'm not <laughs> going to be your puppet. And in doing this, she goes on a quest of her own. And I think her sacrifices are really human in terms of like what she gave up, in terms of like her relationship with Suan Sanche. Like they both were in it together. They find out that Rand exists, but to keep each other safe, to keep things secret, it's like that, that saying, like, the more people who know the secret, then like, someone's going to get screwed, right? Yeah, yeah. So her and Swan Sanche part ways and have to deal in secrecy whenever they're around each other so that neither of them is outed about knowing what they know. Mm -hmm. And so like, I feel like her sacrifices are very human sacrifices and not kind of like this, almost like you said, God with a lowercase g. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting because the, like you said, the, the s kind of decisions and sacrifices that Moraine makes are, maybe there's more of them and they're, you know, steps along the way to get this thing to happen, hopefully. Whereas mm -hmm. Gandalfs are fewer and big. Epic. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, when the decisions are made, they impact the story in a really huge right now kind of way. Um, right. And I think this stems from those two characters, uh, an overall idea of sacrifice that I mentioned earlier when, you know, in the last debate, they say, they decide that, you know, we'll all go to die, basically. And we haven't even heard from Frodo. But if we stay here, it's not going to be any help, and we're going to lose anyways. So let's all go to the Black Gate and do our best to distract Sauron, and maybe Frodo will um, make it to the end there. And I think that stems a lot from, from Gandalf's decision that this is the only way to and it might cost lives and it does cost lives but you know it's gonna it has the potential of saving so many and mm -hmm. everything you know that it's worth it and i think that that's a perspective that someone like gandalf or someone like moraine would be some of the few that would really understand what that means 
Right. Yeah. I, I, that there is a like a true sense of selflessness in yeah. both of them because a lot of the the maybe i don't know if you want to call them lower level characters you you might have some random gondorian or you know someone from <laughs> someone from the two rivers being like oh it'll be fine you know like yeah there might be some bad guys that show up now and then but you know we'll just stick around here in our little corner and it'll be it'll be fine Right. Um, and Gandalf and Moraine are like, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really, I, I love that connection, though, between the two characters, because they really do show up and they're like, look, things seem okay, but like, trust me, <laughs> like, things are not okay. Like, yeah. come with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Gandalf is trying to convince people of that the whole time. You know, there's a lot of things like the Balrog, like the Nazgul, etc., that Gandalf is so much further higher up in the awareness of, you know, that it makes it really interesting to read because, you know, you have these characters like Moraine that understand what's at stake a lot more than our perspective characters. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get to discover it along the way with them and be like, oh, so this is what you meant when you said this was a big deal. <laughs> you yeah. Know, books and There's books ago. <laughs> Yeah, there's that intense warning of like calamity coming. Mm -hmm. With Moraine too, I think a lot of the times she doesn't let everyone know all of the pieces to the puzzle. But I think there's also kind of an air of like her being like, you're lower level, dude. Like you don't need to know all of the pieces just yet. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. We've Which got a while to, to go. <laughs> I don't know if I can trust you yet. Yeah. <laughs> Proves to be frustrating uh, more times than one. Oh, absolutely. Like, yeah. yeah. But I think it, I don't know, it, it, it could have just been something that humored Robert Jordan as well, or he wrote it in that way to keep things mysterious like, purposely, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can't it's... just tell everybody what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it is interesting, that type of character you know, enticing to read where they're like, I don't have time for the people that don't understand what's going on right now um, because yeah. I have way bigger things to try and deal with. So I, I love know, it. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. it's really intriguing and I, it makes me want to know, you know mm -hmm. the answers and stuff. And that's part of why I love Wheel of Time because it takes so long uh, to, you know, to get some of these answers that when you mm -hmm. do, it's like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Stuff's happening now. <laughs> yeah. So I kind of want to move into the intention behind Moraine. And mm -hmm. if we think, you know, Robert Jordan was really inspired by Gandalf and just decided, like, hey, I'm going to do this type of character, but I'm going to make it. A woman <laughs> like do you think it was just kind of inspired by the time the 90s where he's like mm. we need something a little bit different or it was just happenstance i think you know as someone who is not a writer but has played around mm -hmm. with that kind of stuff you can i think you can clearly like not to make it super simplistic but i could totally see robert jordan sitting down and be like Hmm. I need like a guide character. What would be a fun spin on that? And you could like really quickly come up with Moraine. Um, yeah. Because it's just like a obvious different version of it to try. It's almost mm -hmm. like they're both tropes now and you yeah. kind of need <laughs> both of them. You know, you need, you had Gandalf, so it makes sense that we would have a Moraine character. I think that maybe she was an inevitable in that way. Uh, in in some fantasy setting to and i i'm not really aware of you know all the fantasy stories but i'm sure there's other examples of this kind of character but it's the i mean it's the hero's journey to you know that type of guide character and mm -hmm. you could I, like i said you could pretty easily be like okay how do i get a new interesting spin on it and i guess you know, when the first book was being written, that would that would have counted as a new spin, <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, the the biggest 
I would say difference. It's not because she's a woman or something like that, but she feels much more relatable. And it's not a gender thing. I think for me, it's what we talked about, about Gandalf being so epic and almost otherworldly in a sense where Moraine is just, she's just this woman, you know, like she just, she could be like any of us really. And I think the Emmons Field characters, they're kids, right? Like she shows up, you've got Rand, like he doesn't want to go, but he has to. You've got Matt. She's like, don't touch the dagger, Matt. And Matt's <laughs> like, dagger. You know, like she's just, I I can see her like just wanting to pull her hair out and just like yeah, yeah, scream yeah. and like holding back this information because like, look at who she's working with, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think for me, like I'm the eldest in my family. So like I saw her and I saw her around these other characters and I'm like, oh, I get it. Like, I get it. I yeah. understand your pain. <laughs> yeah, I think that you're right, though, that even, you know, if, if we were in the 90s, making her a woman is like, oh, it's a new spin on it. But yeah. thinking about it now, her personality as a, as a uh, comparison to Gandalf is a way more interesting, uh, you know, spin on the character for sure. Mm -hmm. Because like you said, Gandalf is like, okay, we trust him and we're meant to trust him from the beginning. And if you've read The Hobbit, Gandalf is like kind of mysterious, but he's always on your side, you know? Yeah. There's no, there's no, it's, it's almost like it was written and this is oversimplifying it, of course, but you know, when you were, when you look at fantasy you know a song of ice and fire wasn't around yet so we weren't like looking for every character to be sketchy you know right so (laughs) you know in lord of the rings there's no question that there's not even a question that frodo's gonna make it really if you read the prologue (laughs) you know like yeah the hobbits are the good guys gandalf's there to help them aragorn is the king and he is you know got great intentions and Gollum is sneaky and a bad character and it's oversimplifying it a bit, but at the same time, you know, Frodo is not a great character in, in that kind of like sneaky political way. Whereas when we get someone like Moraine, who's got a different personality and like you said, is not, you know, this higher being in, you know, to, to the Emmons fielders, maybe she is original, (laughs) you know, initially, but she's not. (laughs) And that means that now we have more questions because it's like, okay, is she good intentioned? Because she's kind of acting a little bit like maybe she's yeah. not. You know? Yeah. So it's it's interesting to take that character that we, you know, the stereotype of the character, which is Gandalf, and just seeing what you can do with it, right? Yeah, bending it a little bit trying to trying to add different layers i guess but i mean that's one of the things like i don't want to say moraine is a better character because i find her more relatable i do think that gandalf is just when you're talking about some of these characters in fantasy that everyone knows i mean he's find someone on the street who doesn't know (laughs) who gandalf is it's the the (laughs) superman batman spider-man yeah exactly um maybe maybe moraine will have that time someday someday. i don't know (laughs) Um, but But, i i it's interesting because i felt the same way when i started reading wheel of time i was like okay interesting moraine um i like this character and then just like the books themselves in general as you continue on down the story it leaves lord of the rings behind you know what i mean it it Mm -hmm. even by book two and onward it's it's like okay we did the lord of the rings kind of tropes if you want to call them that and then we left them behind and now it's something new and i think that maureen has that same journey where she starts off you know maybe side by side with gandalf but as we progress they their similarities start to branch out and become yeah. more and more distant as the books go. You get into this conversation of which one is more interesting. When I think of it, I think of which which one is more interesting to reread for me, not to necessarily read the first time, but to reread. And 
because Gandalf is such a archetype, I find myself being more invested in rereading about Moraine because there's a lot. I don't know. I don't know if saying layers maybe it's a, is maybe it's a thing. time thing too because yeah. the wheel of time is so much longer. Maybe he had to kind of chip into her character in unexpected ways to keep her interesting <laughs> because yeah. if she was just there for you know 14 books being I, mysterious <laughs> yeah i think that uh the stories are different in their goals in general in terms of lord of the rings for all of its talk about being a long book is not long compared to wheel of time or even to A Song of Ice and Fire, really. And that's not even done yet. So, like, when I read the two of them, I read Lord of the Rings for to enjoy the journey through the story, to see the fantasy elements of the world and things like that. Whereas if I'm reading Wheel of Time, it's a lot more like I want to be with the characters. Because in Lord of the Rings, it's not point of view, necessarily. Not in the same kind right. of close way as Wheel of Time. And with Wheel of Time, it's it's like, I want to go through the journey in Rand's head. You know, I want to go through the journey with Egwene or whoever else, you know, and be with mm -hmm. the character. So you want it to be longer because you get to spend more time with them. Whereas Lord of the Rings, I don't think needs to be any longer than it is. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think there's, I think there's something to say about the Lord of the Rings where it's, I don't want to say simple as Simple's the wrong word, but I think like there is an elegance in some of the more simple parts of the story. Like it's a very elegant story. It doesn't need to be long. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Wheel of Time. Yeah, and it's funny because I'm sure that when Lord of the Rings was released, <laughs> that was like this is short. Um, <laughs> but right. <laughs> Tolkien has an amazing way of layering in meaning and layering and stuff that you can pick up on next time you know the the great example from the podcast that i edit for is when give them uh, a shout out by the, the way <laughs> the prancing pony podcast is yes the, is the uh the podcast that i edit for awesome awesome guys over there um and in the first season of uh, the lord of the rings chapters that they were breaking down talk about the pity of Gollum, and frodo is frodo says you know it's a pity Bilbo didn't just kill Gollum when he had the chance. And Gandalf says, Gandalf talks about pity with Frodo and how us as the reader can interpret that. You know, is it a is it a is it a pity? Like, does he deserve to die because he's evil? Or does he deserve to die because he deserves to be released from the, the anguish world, from, yeah. from having the ring and everything like that? So you can there's tons of passages like that where it's like you know, what do you mean by this? And you can read it this year and then read it next year and it'll mean something differently. So I think it works being brief, quote unquote, yeah. um, in comparison because there's so much layered into, you know, each line. So it's trying, I think it's trying to tell an epic tale and uses those techniques to make that come across. Whereas The Wheel of Time is, I think, very much about the character's journeys the whole time. So you're there with them in every moment from the start to the end. So yeah. it's a different experience for sure. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to make a quick segue and talk about you and the projects that you are doing sure. because this is kind of, this is pretty cool for the Wheel of Time community. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I can talk about the Lord of the Rings uh, version of it first and then yeah. uh, lead into the Wheel of Time. So I've been working for the past two years or so on a project called A Long Expected Soundscape, which is an audio accompaniment to the stories and to the audiobook. So I've designed individual sound effects and I've designed individual ambiences for the Shire, for Fangorn, for all those places and written an original score and those line up perfectly with the official audiobook so you can get your audiobook and you can get my soundscape put the two of them together and you get this immersive experience of the story so you know you would hear gandalf fighting the balrog and you'd hear the flames and you'd hear you know the music that i've written for that and the echoes of moria all around you 
for every you know every minute of the story and uh, that's you know 60 plus hours um so it's quite the experience all of that to say i'm working on the wheel of time now of course because here's my cat and say hello <laughs> to <Ro. laughs> um with the wheel of time i'm doing the exact same thing i'm using the uh, original audiobooks not the rosamond versions because uh, those aren't finished yet but for the michael kramer and kate redding i'm going through and i'm lining up you know every sound effect for you know their horses for when they use the power for all these kind of things and designing ambience for emmons field and for uh you know every step along the journey and i'll be writing music themes for that and uh piecing it together all the same as the lord of the rings and uh eventually doing all of the many books in the series. So, um, can I, am I allowed to say that I've heard a little bit? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I've heard a little bit and it's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's really cool. I mean, it just, it, it's such a similar experience to like when you're watching the TV show, you get so much more emotion. I feel like with the music and hearing what's going on around you, like, are they walking on a dirt path or is it like cobblestone like you hear everything it's just really cool exactly yeah and i'm and i'm being as meticulous as i can and you know i'll i'll send amber questions and ask you know <laughs> what would this sound what you know what does this sound like it in this chapter would you hear the two rivers at this distance you know i'm a lot of things like that i'm taking into account and so there's a lot of ways that you can apply this experience the main one like i said is with the audiobooks but you know what i'll do with the lord of the rings is i'll just put on a chapter without the audiobook and i can hear my way through the journey and uh you know i can be in fangor forest and hear the ants walking around me and i'm so excited to do that for wheel of time where you know you can experience the story in a new way is the goal just like we have the, you know, we have the books, we have the audiobooks, we have the show, and I'm trying to make this its own experience. Where yes, you can sync it up with the audiobooks, but you can also just listen and uh, hear every step along the along the way. And I think that there'll be, it's almost like you're hunting for little Easter eggs the whole time, yeah. and it's a pretty fun experience. <laughs> you know, I always use the example of in chapter one of the of the Lord of the Rings, you'll hear. Gandalf's wagon come up the up the hill, and you'll hear the, hear his fireworks go off and stuff like that. So there's very clear, you know, moments along the story that you'll you'll hear, and you'll be like, "Oh yeah, they're crossing White Bridge now." You know, I can <laughs> I can hear that, um, or the Trollocs are attacking, or you know, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So uh, it's a big project, and uh, I'm excited to get it underway. And actually, if uh, if it's okay to mention. Uh, I have pre-orders up on my website, and the cool thing about the pre-orders is that you can get involved if you want. So this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so if and you don't need any fancy technology for this, you just need a phone that's decently modern. And you know, if you wanted to, you could send me some samples that I could use for Trolloc uh, growls or whatever, or you know, you could be a voice in the distance and in the white tower or something like that you know all that kind of stuff i need people to contribute to which would be awesome so if you're interested in that then you can pre-order it on my website and get involved and i will say just as a little quick disclaimer if because this question comes up a lot with lord of the rings um in the soundscape there's no you know written content from the books in it so there's no copyright issue between the two of them i when i sell my soundscape there's no audiobook included you have to buy that yourself but you can put the two of them together pretty uh, quickly and easily. So yeah, that's the, the project in a not so small nutshell. <laughs> Man, I mean, there's a lot of big moments. In terms of the eye of the world, is there a certain moment that you're maybe most excited for? Hmm. I think that the there's a couple moments so far that I'm like, oh, this is going to be really fun. There's always moments that are, you know, some moments will be really exciting for sound effects some will be really exciting for music uh so it kind of alternates but you know the the initial trollic attack is going to be really fun um because it's really brutal yeah um it's also as a quick side note really interesting because i don't have to 
abridge this in any way like the show does. So it's right. going to be, you know, what happened for real, we're going to be able to hear. So the Trolloc yeah. attack is the big one. I'm thinking of the Ravens where yeah, Karen yeah. and Egwene are running from the Ravens. Yeah, that's going to be really fun. That was a that was another one. I think that doing a lot of the, you know, the scenes in the inns where there's mm -hmm. some music and stuff is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. Could really get people's voices in on those for sure. Um, and just trying to think about the ambience, you know, what does the blight sound like? Mm -hmm. uh, and squishy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, music wise, let's see if I can think of any moments for music. I think that even just the introduction, you mm -hmm. know, the very first introduction into the world is really going to be fun to get some music in for that. And like I said, I'm going to write themes for as many of the characters and places and things like that as I can. So they all have their own personalities and their own evolution over the whole series. Also, I get, because again, it's not an adaptation, mm -hmm. there's some fun stuff that I can do because I know the whole story. And so if something is hinted at early, you know, foreshadowed or whatever, then musically I can foreshadow it as well. Loop it back around. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. And um, so, yeah, a lot of a lot of fun stuff to come. I'm really excited to try and design what the power sounds like uh, to try and make it, you know, different from the show a little bit, but still feel like it belongs uh, in the same way. Yeah, I mean, there's huge moments in later books, obviously, but uh, it's all it's all exciting. I'm yeah. excited for all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for even the small moments. You know, like sitting sitting by the fire with Elias um, and hearing about how Perrin's abilities work, maybe, you know, like little yeah. quiet moments like that. It really elevates it to, you know, you'll hear the wolves in the distance, you'll hear the fire crackling. You just made me think about Lord of Chaos when the wolves, the, the we come, the we come, the wolves are coming. It's like thousands of them. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All of those moments. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's a big project and it's going to be a long journey to do all of them. But, uh, you know, if I can, if, if I do get, I mean, I'm going to do it anyways, but if I get pre-orders and stuff like that, then that means that I can put more and more time towards it, uh, yeah. which is really exciting. And I'm working on other projects at the same time. I'm working on the Hobbit, working on uh, the first Harry Potter and stuff like that too. But because the wheel of time is such a big endeavor, I, I want to basically just be working on it all the time now uh, so that I can get, get a move on. on them. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, that's what pre-orders are securing essentially. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Make sure that it can, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do them all anyways, but pre-orders kind of decide what the focus is on, I guess a little bit yeah, more. So that makes sense. Um, it's the type of project where when you think about it, the more you think about it, I think the more there is to get excited about you know, yeah. as they sail down the river, you know, you can hear the ship around you, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, all these Creaking. little moments. Yeah. And yeah. just to make it feel like you're there. And uh, I think it'll be really, really fun, especially because with Lord of the Rings, lots of epic stuff, lots of great moments and music and tons and tons of horses. <laughs> um, but Wheel of Time is the first chance that I'm going to have to be in a pov kind of story and so i've talked about this with uh the a song of ice and fire one that i'm working on too because mm -hmm. that's pov but you know when we're in perrin's pov the ambiences and the sound effects are probably going to be louder because ah. you can pick up on things more yeah. than than the others can so you can really play with the perspective more it's, Maybe. It, it gets very meta, you know, yeah, like yeah. thinking about all of the little things. Exactly. That, that's, you know, just super fun details that I get to play with. So, yeah. And go. I think, too, this is a this is a pretty cool opportunity in terms of like accessibility for some people too. Mm -hmm. like not everyone can hold a book or, you know, like it's it's just an extra element to kind of make things even more enjoyable for audiobook listeners so it's yeah yeah cool. if if anyone has listened to you know any star wars audiobooks is a, the best example probably they have you know lightsaber sounds and sound effects and stuff so it's like that but even more specific so every yeah. moment and it's all mixed in 
uh, Dolby Atmos, so it's 3D, uh, you know, moving around your headphones kind of technology. Yeah. Um, so yeah, really exciting, and I hope people uh, are excited and want to check it out. Yeah. Well, I think I think we will wrap it up there before we go too long. But I just wanted <laughs> to say thank you for joining me. It's been really fun talking about more rain and Gandalf, and it's really <laughs> exciting what you're doing. I will add links in the description for Sounds anyone awesome. who wants to see what you're working on and where they can find it. And maybe maybe I can have you back someday for more Lord of the Rings Wheel of Time <laughs> mashup. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And hopefully maybe when we do another one, I uh I'll have a little sample and I can I can play that too. That'd that would be, awesome. be great. All right. So I'm gonna end it there and I will see you back next time.